said talk to me, damn it, or else I'm gonna throw you in the fire! You stupid bitch, you filthy! <laughs> Welcome back to Flyover State of Fear. I got another great guest for you guys today. Petros from Page, Caged In and Coppola Connections. How's it going, Petros? It's going very well, thank you. For, uh, yeah, thanks thanks uh, massively for inviting me on uh, your podcast, Joe. I'm, I'm excited to talk about this film. Yeah, no problem. Today we're uh, talking about uh, Hellraiser. But first, uh, yeah, I would say during the thick of uh, the COVID pandemic, I went on... Petros's podcast, um, uh, Caged In, and we talked, uh, you know, pristine cage film in Traspass. <laughs> uh, no, was it? Tra- yeah, it was Traspass. And uh, no, we had a great time. And um, I have this, I have my own uh, horror one, you know, of course I'd have you as a guest on. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's, yeah that, that was a really hazy time of recording podcasts. I think it was in that kind of milieu of everyone not having to work and mm-hmm. I, I was but i was working like a workhorse on the podcast i was like literally every single second i had spare i was like you were like episode let's record an episode I, I don't know i don't remember the the bigger gets you got at that time but i remember being like yeah and you're like nah everyone's available just just dm just send them a writer's <laughs> available and i was like okay yeah <laughs> as i think i was in the middle of like the time i was trying to watch like every James Bond and like saw like 500 <laughs> movies that year or some shit, you know, the, the, this was like 2020. I'm sure we each said some very like sad things on that pod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, I, I imagine like 2020 will be a really weird time capsule of like, you can kind of gauge everyone's experience kind of around the world just by listening to podcasts. Sure. At least throughout that year. Well, I, I, yeah, I think I don't know. I got to I got to a point where I, I said to people, "Let's just not like we kind of had a chat beforehand about how everyone's doing the pandemic." And I was like, "Is this just going to age really badly?" And then the pandemic like kind of continued for like, do you know what I mean another year? Yeah, it was <laughs> like, all going to keep doing it. <laughs> oh shit, this is my job now. <laughs> um, no, nah, that's great though. Um, so yeah, once again, thanks for you know joining us. And uh, if anyone listening, you. Uh, you do put out some really great uh, shows, though, because you don't only have Cage Gin, you have Coppola Connections, uh, which is just a feat in itself. You're trying to, you already went through Cage's repertoire, and now to go <laughs> through every Coppola um, is kind of wild when I like wrap my head around it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm I, I, just going with Francis, which is this, you know, you're, you're, you're going with... Uh, you know, Nick's brother and uh, offshoots like you know uh, Sophia and yeah. everyone. It, it's it's kind of a marvel to see. <laughs> I'm throwing in like ones that other people would like. There's a lot of like head scratches on there as well. There's people going like, "Why are you speaking about like uh, being John Malkovich?" It's like, well, because Spike Jones was married to Sophia Coppola <laughs> for a select period. And well, like he was probably at the dinner table at Christmas, so he's he's got to be covered on this podcast. And like yeah. his 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 career doesn't happen without the Coppola family as well. If that's, that's the case. If that's the case, then I need you to do the jackass films. He he, he wasn't ma- he wasn't he wasn't married to her at that point. Damn it. Only Damn. it's only when they were married. Yeah 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 yeah. Ah. yeah. But I don't a, a jackass connection to like Sophia Coppola. Uh, Chris Pontius turns up in the film somewhere, and I always <laughs> love that like kind of connective tissue. That's that, so like, silly. She wouldn't have probably met Chris Pontius without Spike Jones, because I imagine like what they split up in like two thousand and two. Yeah, that's so, and that's Jackass like one, the movie one. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can cover Jackass one. Yeah, maybe that's a sneaky one that can Cause can get in there. That was Jackass one, and then. And my my wife always laughs when she's like, 
when he, I think he accepted his Oscar for her, she's like, I've seen that man's butt cheeks on Jackass, and he's now up there with an Oscar. Yes. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, no, that's great. So just that that's just such a, a joy to kind of watch and I give it a listen sometimes on uh, through Twitter and through Nonia. So, um, but as I ask everyone, any new listeners, um, what is your horror origin story? You know, kind of, and uh, that can be answered any way. You know, if you're into horror or like kind of flirt around it, or even if you're not into horror and you just like it, like what are your origins of uh, your story? So I guess like my origin of like being, I kind of look at this as like, when was I first like scared by movies and like that, that kind of relationship you have to fear. And I think there's like twofold. There was like a eighties version of Hansel and Gretel, which kind of like chilled me to my very core. Okay. And uh, Nicholas Rogue's The Witches with Angelica Houston. Yeah. So I think it's was... like is based that film is basically entry level horror for kids. It would be. Yeah. It, it's it, I mean it's creepy visuals. It's a thousand yeah. times better than that um remake they just put out yeah 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 the, the, yeah the robert zemeckis cgi like yeah yeah but like it, i think it was that and then like over the years and like it's funny we're talking about we're going to be talking about hellraiser because i just have vivid memories of just being a kid and going around like one of my family friends house and there's like an older son and just seeing the vhs cover uh, it's a it's an iconic like VHS cover of just Pinhead and holding, you know, the puzzle box glowing. And uh, I actually reversed my um our well, when we get to the movie, I thought I reversed my arrow. The video came with the double sided, and I made the cover. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> you can flip it, and it's more of a newer artwork. And I always prefer the original uh, poster run. <laughs> then, uh, but yeah, that um. That's interesting. So do you think that Hansel and Gretel, was it a like TV movie more or was it the, um, I think I'm getting it confused in my head with there was a Snow White horror movie out back in uh, the 90s. It wasn't even like a horror movie. It It was was creepy. It was just creepy. Yeah, it's just really, really creepy. And like it was all practical sets. And I think like that's a thing as well. I think like I... Any like anything practical, even like now, if it's like a horror movie that relies on like practical effects and stuff like that, like film, like recent films that kind of like uh, really like chill me to my core is like Hereditary and Midsummer, like, terrifying. And I, I, I like vague memories of being a teen as well. Like like yeah, my kind of journey through horror. I remember like the first time like being scared in the daytime was watching The Shining. Okay. Just, just being like because that film like it's all it's all brightly lit all the time and i think like that's where like there's a nice like kind of vein to something like midsummer because it's like Mm -hmm. everything's bright and you 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 associate fear with the the dark and stuff like that you're you're not alone in the shining i mean i've I've talked to a lot of people and that's a common thread of uh, younger or like early teens and finding the shining being scared at any point and uh, yeah, daytime horror when it gets you, like you said, Midsummer or The Shining. And I've always found from The Shining, um, the scariest thing to me is you could feel the cold. The, yeah. The audio, there's an audio uh, consistent like uh, whipping of that wind and snow, but it's it's lonely and cold even though there's more than one person on the frame. And, and I think the thing with that film as well is the ambiguity of it makes it scarier because you mm-hmm. don't. You don't quite like there's so many like unanswered questions, whether it's like the man in the bear suit giving that guy a blow job or like <laughs> why is he in the picture at the end? And like I think oh, you... horror that taps into like existential questions or just That's kind what of, gets like, you. Yeah, something that can kind of like I don't know, and like I re- yeah, again, I, I as a teen I remember sitting down and watching rosemary's baby that's one life. for me that one killed as a teen discovered it and it's uh, still to this day sits with me because i think it's that thing it, it, it taps into like i think it's things that tap into like real fears and what that is it's that idea of like you feeling like uh something's going on and like yeah. when you turn to is like in on it Do you know, I've, I think al- that- I, I've always described them and i guess same goes with modern for a modern one like hereditary 
it's uh and midsummer and uh those movies but rosemary's baby uh i was kind of everyone's in on the joke car because that's the scariest thing it's like everyone's in on the joke and you're not like and rosemary's baby that that it really gets scary to like the devil stuff whatever it's her running around and no one's stopping her because they're like no i'll help you out and helping her out is to you know get yeah, your baby yeah. to the scene um yeah. <laughs> so uh no that's that's a perfect perfect description of uh i could totally see your not your just your origins but your journey of like you know what your interests are and yeah because um, there, there was like was big periods of my life where i didn't watch horror because whether it's like partners i was with and kind of my like film habits would be dictated about what we watch together and sure that and like now now it's kind of like i don't know massively like i think like when you find those directors as well that it's like you find them like nobody kind of puts mm-hmm. you on. one do you know what I mean like a close friend might put you onto it and then you start you, you get in on the ground floor i remember oh yeah a friend of mine like giving me innkeepers like um, your tie west baby and then like like following his career house of the like, devil and... yeah i went to i went to like a london film festival screening of the sacrament and again Ooh. that was one that really sat with me again it's like one that's all in daytime it's kind of very much plays with like real world horror this idea of uh cults and stuff like that I th- yeah i think i think i think my i, I think I'm, I, I have a fear of being like the puppet of a cult yeah kind of being, uh dragged well, into a cult well so- <laughs> Petros, I have um, some uh, skin cream product I'd like you to sell. <laughs> uh, you know, you could start here and then we can move on up and then, you know, get your friends. That's that's a cult that I'm afraid of. Uh, no, I totally get that. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, dude, it's fun. It's it's fun to dive deep and there's so many different lanes of horror and something like what you chose, a Hellraiser, um, and I'll kind of just jump more into that, is I found... Um, you know, at least the first one, because of the cover, right, and the iconography of Pinhead, most people associate it as, like, a slasher, and it's far from it. Yeah. But I'm saying, if you asked anyone on the street that has a familiarity with just, like, the, the images and not really the movie, it's like a slasher. But when you boil it down, it's, it's uh, before we really get into it all, it's just kind of a heady heady practical effects tale yeah it's it's, uh, it's more art house than you would think it was going to be as well mm-hmm. it's more kind of like subversive and weird than it i don't know yeah i think because it's one of these well it's it's got to be like the is it the most sequels to a franchise like the kind it, of most entries or, or at least it's gunning for it right like it is let me see um it has a lot. I mean, they're you know they've. Uh, I'm looking forward to the um, the Hulu series with um, the reboot because it's just going to be the Telltale Heart. Yes. But one, it, two, three. It looks like there's ten. I don't know if that's the most or the least, but it for a pristine one because I always kind of tell people I'm only really familiar with the first two. I don't know the whole fr- fr- uh, the whole series. I tell a lot of people I'm like I love the I like the first one and I love the second one. I actually think the second one's a more it's more of a straight par. But there's a lot more going on, but that's not what we're here to talk about. But <laughs> before we begin, I am so I know as before I start anything, um, I'm going to read the synopsis that I haven't read yet from <laughs> Google. And the point being is sometimes these are right on the money or they are way off. <laughs> so let's see what let's see what Hellraiser declares itself as. Sexual deviant Frank inadvertently opens a portal to hell when he tinkers with a box he bought while abroad. The act unleashes gruesome beings called Cenobites, who fear Frank's body apart. Who tear. Uh, when Frank's brother and his wife, Julia, move into Frank's old house, they accidentally bring what is left of Frank back to life. Frank then convinces Julia, his one-time lover, to lure men back to the house so he can use their blood to reconstruct himself. Pretty good description, I'll say, yes. for... Uh, from what I've seen from uh, just Google, and it's usually I think pulled from Wiki, uh, from Wiki or IMDb, usually their ass. So that's that, and then um, kind of you know uh, some housekeeping with that. I mean, a million dollar budget. It was fourteen million, 14, made fourteen point six million at the box office. 
written, directed, screenplay uh, by Clive Barker and wear up in my Candyman shirt during this recording for Clive Barker. And then it is based on the uh, novella The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker. Um, the, one of the more interesting things I did find before we do is, is like they just let Clive Barker direct a movie and he's never yeah. been on a film set before and yeah. like couldn't even take out a book from the library of how to direct. So he winged it, which is so impressive because it's such a well-made movie. Yeah, what I love about the, that is like there's no second unit of for this movie either like clive barker and his unit just they filmed everything so yeah. like, when you get those shots of like the maggots up close or like the rats and that he was that's there just, that, he was there yeah they were just all there and like yeah I, I, I love the idea as well that obviously like clive barker like you're saying like candy man his kind of stamp on horror is real big like he's kind of like really mm-hmm. like whether you like know it or not like he's kind of I don't know, like, I guess he's, like, <laughs> like the closest us Brits have to, like, a Stephen King in, 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 a, in a weird way. Like, I'd call him now. That was an answer. What is your, um, we kind of really went into your relationship in this movie uh, with the Clyde Barker in this film? Because you're right. It is, like, a Stephen King uh, for, 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 uh, for the Brits. And um, it, uh, Candyman's one of my favorites. Uh-huh. But... Um, and then there's also, I'm not too familiar with his work to be transparent, but that more than just what we know, like Lord of Illusions, I know got a movie and that's okay. Yeah. I really love, um, I really love Nightbreed. I find that film really fascinating. That was like Clive Barker's second, um, second directorial effort. And Gosh. like, I gotta yeah. check that one out then. He's really, he's, he, yeah, he's really fascinating. And like, I like the fact that he directed this film off the basis because he didn't like the way that his stuff was being adapted. That was kind of like his driving force. He was like, I don't like the way that people are visualizing my, my books. So like, let me have a go. <laughs> and then Stephen King tried it and it was failed completely at it <laughs> with Maximum Overdrive. Uh, yeah, that was, that was Maximum Cocaine. I was going to say, just all blow, doesn't remember even being on set. <laughs> Uh, but no, that's awesome that he took control like that. That's why I said it was so impressive to me that he was just given money because it, 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 the fact that this got a big, that this is a theatrical run release had a, a and it, it looks, it looks like other movies out like that are, uh, well made, right? It's not, um, like it's not, it's not the first evil dead, right? Where the first evil dead's impressive. But it is made with the home video. Yeah, the, well, like if you like if you look at it, you kind of go and then look at the budget. You're like, they made this, but that it's like everyone must have been breaking their balls to like, um, kind of work overtime, double time. Do you know what I mean? Like, kind yeah. of, the effects guys must have been like on pennies. Do you know what I mean? Or, or like this, the, it, it feels like a passion project because. The, it's like, it, I don't know. It's just like everything. The effects are beautiful in this. I mean, and the fact that the where I was kind of like harping on being like, oh my god, he's like literally never been around. I mean, he's been around it, but like not even the first movie. Like just giving those reins of whatever it is, and the the way they hide clearly hid in a good way like the effects in the dark in some scenes like that that's really mature filmmaking to do that than just well we we did it so here's everything on screen you know yeah. like i've watched enough uh bad straight to video uh horror movies that where it's like well we made it so here it is and it's like no you gotta light it properly this movie's does well, and if you think about it like there's maybe like seven like 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 under 10 like locations mm-hmm. in this the attic the yeah, pet like, shop it's like yeah there's a couple of like uh exterior shots of like different places like kind of kirsty walking around the city there'll be like the the bonfire at the end the kind of uh frank having the exchange but like there's not a lot of like it doesn't kind of try and overstretch it it keeps it contained and i think like that's what makes it i don't know so great is that like 
it really gets you to get to know the like the house specifically. But the house is is so um, neat. You know, because it is that, like you said, you get to know it. It has these like so many rooms, and then like it's 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 eerie in some situations, and they do a good job of laying out like this is where the attic is, this is where the danger happens. There's these amazing shots that kind of like they're not repeated, that but like it's almost like the camera is like floating, like like disembodied, and it, like it will always be kind of heading up towards the attic, and it's like it's always kind of hack and cliche to say it, but like. The house is like a character. I was trying to avoid the cool <laughs> phrasing, but it's absolutely. It's like, like by the end, it, it is living and breathing. It's like, <laughs> it's not even like his character. It's like the house is like a, a living embodiment of the And it just of blows Frank. up. Like, yeah. uh, bleeding in the walls and stuff like that. It is like, it is, it, 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 I don't know. It, it has a heart and it's, I don't know, it's, it's rotten to the core. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah, it, it um and one thing which is what we're talking about shots kind of before we start you know breaking down I think scene by scene and um one of the ones that captured me on this watch is the scene after um Kirsty um uh, in cover finds out like who Frank and you know what um what Julie are doing and she where she runs away and the scene when she passes the nun and it was the first, it caught me a lot this time when she. The camera just lingers on her. They didn't put any, you know, they didn't put any makeup on her or very little. She's distressed. And it it's so different of a shot from the rest of the movie. Uh, oh. It just really stood out to me. And just kind of while we're talking about camera shots, it's this like. There's the, 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 like a really clever thing of a, like a, a, an amazing, like it must have, yeah, just amazing location scouting mm-hmm. to kind of find a shot and it's again, gray yeah. it's yeah. you know it's 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 I, I i i had a moment like watching this where there's a shot of kirsty walking like it, it kind of looks like a kind of like dockyard or something like that mm-hmm. but the camera's like pointed up at these kind of like cr- like kind of fixed cranes mm-hmm. i don't and even the, know the the kind of framework of it almost like what you know when the lament configuration is kind of in its like full stage where you have yeah. it sticking out it almost resembles that. And like, obviously that's like, they, they haven't set designed that. They've just gone, oh. This works. This, this works. This will be like nice foreshadowing of this kind of like, and yep. yeah, it's like really, like really cleverly done. And like, I don't know, the camera angle of it, it's just it well, with, pretty woozy. Yes. <laughs> and it uses its, its uh, like you said, its iconography. And there's so many like these religious undertones and, Clearly, Kai Barker's trying to say something about that. Um, but, you know, so going through it, we do start off the movie with um, in a shop in Morocco. And uh, we find out uh, Frank, was it Frank or just a person? I think it's just a person. Sorry. Yeah, it's Frank. It's Frank. It's Frank. It's Frank. Yeah, He's yeah. buying a puzzle box. He's buying the puzzle box or receiving it in Morocco. And then he cuts to him in a... Uh, with all candles lit around opening up the box and we don't see the full thing yet but getting hooked to part and we get a glimpse of the cenobites yeah and one of the things i noticed on this watch as well is there's that scene where the cenobites are kind of in the attic and they've got those like spinning poles like those kind of like uh spinning boards and i guess play like more of a prominent part in free, a film that you haven't seen, uh, that those kind of uh, okay, that, that that they 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 become very prominent. But nice. uh, one of the things I noticed on this watch is there's just a couple of dicks <laughs> on, on on one of the kind of yeah spinning planks of wood and it's like just like body parts and stuff. Well, like that's that. what you see. You see these these um just body parts like laid out everywhere. I mean, like chains hanging down. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of really grimy that's what i like about it that's a good word you talking about like frank i just love the small details like you just like you you get who the character is from that opening dirty fingernails dirtiest fingernails in the world yeah (laughs) oh you know i mean even um always you cannot have a place where he doesn't have a bed on the floor Yes, yeah, yeah. He's, he's got a, he's got a, a, a mattress and like he's got that weird kind of ivory statue of like, and there's yeah. 
there's like again great visuals you get that kind of visual of the ivory statue That's with it. like a cockroach like kind of like scurrying past it and the it's bugs kind of... the bugs in this movie i mean that was the you know main the main one of the main fun facts is like one of the few movies they had a maggot wrangler <laughs> um so yeah they had these bugs and maggots and it was someone's job to get them that that's that that's what people call me when i got my penis out the maggot <laughs> I'll join you. I'll join you. Um, all right. So I have uh, the Maggot, Maggot Wrangler with us uh, on the pod today. Uh, stage name. So, um, so, but yeah, so we get there and then, you know, it's very mysterious and it's like dead, basically. That's what you perceive it as. And then it just kind of gives us a uh, time jump. I'm sorry, someone does pick up, a mysterious person does grab the box, but that's not that relevant, to be honest with you, into the movie. It's just, this box now travels, how I always found it. Like, this box has watchers that take it from place to place. Yeah, 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 and it kind of always returns to the, like, this film could have easily been a a perfect one and done. Like, do you know what I mean? It, It seems that way. I mean, like, to jump to the end, I know we... You know, it ends with a, um, oh, this, onto the next tail of the box, right? Yeah. It easily could have been a one and done. Um, I mean, as this, I should say, Krampus has the same ending as this, right? Like, zoom out and you see the, the story you just saw within the object of yes. the film. Uh, I will say that I think the, uh, the pleasure box is probably one of my favorite pieces of horror iconography. Um, yeah. Compared to like, uh, I don't know, like compared to like some like Freddy's Claw and things like that, like that's that's in there. It's a cool just structure that you could have. Yeah, you can you can get um you can get Rubik's cubes that are in that design and oh, like nice. or like you can get replicas of it. But like even just I don't know, there's something about it that's like really creepy to me and just kind of inviting that into my house. I'm like. No. I, and it, no, thank you. Because it's, it's no, I don't. I don't have one. I at least to my left. <laughs> I have a bunch of horror figures. This whole room, as I said, my my wife is not into horror movies at all. But our whole back room of our apartment is just horror merch. <laughs> um, I have no, I have no Hellraiser stuff. But um, I also think you said it's creepy. You know, what it's creepy too because it's Clive Barker and it's clearly supposed to be sexual. Yes. The the lightly rubbing the top to expel out the the cube. You know, it's it's a it's a un, I'm doing it right now. It's an unsettling gesture. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and like one of the things like about this film is it's like it's really horny. It's oh, like fucking! I horny. can't. Wait. I'll get. We'll get to the horny because it's <laughs> it's baffling because there's two. I mean, there's you know what? There's four characters that are just so fucking horny. Um, but we meet. Um, so some time passes and we meet Larry. And Julia, and they're uh, they're a couple. They kind of allude, you know, they they clearly have like tension between them and issues, but they're a married couple. And you immediately know Larry didn't. You're Larry's Frank's brother, guy you met in the beginning, and they don't get along. He rather his brother dead. There's no relationship there. I always found it as Frank's probably just some, uh, you know, burned all of his bridges and uh, probably just drug use and. Black basically sheet everything. The family, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like kind yeah. Of... Like, yeah, Black Sheet and a little more where even you, your brother is, doesn't give a shit where you are. Yeah. Um, And Larry and that, and they're looking around and they're exploring the house and, you know, it's disgusting because clearly, like, it's been abandoned forever. There's maggots and rats and... Uh, but Julia screams uh, when she gets to the attic and she discovers one of those dirty beds on the top. And they're like, um, or sorry, on the ground, they're like, you think it was squatters? And he's like, no, it's Frank. And he finds that um, that ivory statue of the naked lady. And uh, then he, Frank goes, deals with something else. And Julia hangs back and starts looking through photos of Frank and is instantly horny uh or at least that's how she's presenting there like she's turned on by this interested and as the viewer and i think she finds i think she like 
she's sifting through because obviously as an audience we're not privy to the fact i was just gonna say yeah she finds she finds a photo and takes it and i think that's the one because i'm not sure if you ever see the photo but it's it's a photo of them two together right like well it's it's, a photo of no it's it's a photo of uh of him and another woman it's just he's more in clear frame that's what i thought because it was a yeah it was a i think it's i think it's a yeah, it's the um, the woman of color that he's with in the photo. So it's different, but she rips it apart to like jealousy and you know, jump. Obviously, people listening by now, this this spoilers. We're talking about the full movie. Um, yeah, you find out that they had not shortly after they had a an affair together, Frank and Julia. And Julia is like whirlwind, like over head over heels, obsessed and in love with him. Yeah, and I and like I find that aspect of it really like I don't know really interesting because this film's like playing with and the like visuals up to this and like when like the kind of themes of it it's like somewhat like a fairy tale almost you know what I mean like it's got that like she like Julia's like a wicked stepmother but then it kind of I don't know it plays with like the whole like uh, I guess like Dom sub relationship like it's, yeah you're so very. The- kind of submissive to frank and kind of like almost needs him in this it's 50 of shades of gray before 50 shades <laughs> of gray. but yeah there's the dom sub relationship and i think that's more of it she bought into being his his sub yeah. and um because you reveal when you because the, the photos that frank had in that box are like a bit important to that they're all they're all sex themed photos yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they get a little more intense as she looks through and it seemed like, you know, their relationship went there, but never, it got broken off fully before. I think it went like so intense. Cause Frank always was like, well, I'll do what I want to you. If you turn yourself over to me at some point and she bought fall in, but um, yeah, I, it's fairy tale-ish. Yeah. Cause she's not. And I mean, it, it compared to something like candy, man, that's fairy tale-ish too. Like, there's a a fucked up love story here Mm -hmm. um and you know i do think they play with those themes well yeah there's like the kind of like there's the there's almost like a a princess in like the 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 kirsty character do you know what i mean and like there's there's the very slightly undercooked like charming prince who comes yeah they really half bake his character he's uh (laughs) but talking about horny those two like, oh <laughs> God! That's why I said there's four because the only one that's not horny is Larry. Yeah, he tries. He no, no, no. This is why I say he's not because when she starts making out with him on the hallway to stop him from going up to the attic, he's like, "Nah, I'm good. Like, we should go check." <laughs> like, I was like, "Oh, he's not into he." He uh, so, but yeah, so we we do get that backstory between the two of them and. Little bit after that kind of scene, um, we see them moving into this house. This house is a complete dump, but uh, Larry is like dead set. He's like, "You guys like the house, right?" Everything he always says, <laughs> "Like you love the house, right?" And it's 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 just an okay house at the end of the day. It's not like um, actually, weirdly enough, it's not like that very eighties like super rich stylistic house that's in two. Well, what? Yeah, or what apartment. Was- what I find interesting as well, and like this comes from, because obviously this is New World Cinema who like kind of funded this movie, mm-hmm. right? That released this, is like, because <laughs> obviously there's some American money pumped into this movie, but it's filmed in the UK. It kind of like, it feels stripped of like a kind of national identity. Sure. Yeah. I, I was trying to figure out like, what town are they? Like, I assume they're in upstate New York. Or supposed um, to be because he's she saying they moved from Brooklyn. Yeah, but like she, he says, he says to her like, "You're with like you're back in your like home turf," and she's very she's very much British. So yeah. maybe it's British because I was also trying to tell like the men she brings home from the bar. Yeah, like they, some of them have accents and some of them don't. Well, like there's there's ADR like up the wazoo in this mm-hmm. film. Like Frank has like uh, uh, like. Is dubbed completely. By yeah, him. I heard that. I was trying. It's hard <laughs> to tell if it's the same actor sometimes that you saw in the beginning of the movie. Um, 
to the voice yeah. doesn't you don't really hear his voice i guess in the beginning of the movie but like yeah you're right that adr is is heavy yeah yeah because uh, it's a different actor it's not it's, not, <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's yeah 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 it's it, it, it got an american actor in and i think even like her boyfriend and like there's a guy who like that guy who like checks if uh, Kirsty's okay when she like passes when she's passing out in the street. Like you can just tell like so people weird. have been dubbed with American accents. I'm sorry like, on behalf of America. I'm sorry. No, you didn't I, I, that. <laughs> I kind of I kind of understand it and like I my 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 ears like tune, like tune to it. Like I've watched like a lot of like uh, do you know what I mean like jallo films and stuff mm-hmm. like that so i'm used to seeing films that are like everyone speaking in their native tongue and then it's just dubbed anyway yeah. like <laughs> in England. It, um, it's weird because it, it presents itself as like i mean it's just american bias here as an american film sometimes you know i'm just like yeah like i said yeah they're in they're in a countryside kind of town or a small town and that and because it's only set in a house i don't think anything of it uh-huh. um so, actually, this reminds me of one thing. Although, I'll say this. If they did film in Australia, um, the only thing they can't change is the doorknobs are higher in Australia. <laughs> so, so if you ever watch the movie, uh, uh, don't look, uh, no, uh, better watch out. Better watch out, the Christmas horror movie. It's supposed to be in America. It's an Australian. It's a, They filmed in all Australia. And... Uh, the director was like, yeah, the only thing I couldn't change with my budget is all the doors. The the knobs are like, like say they're here, they're like up to here. So next time I watch <laughs> that movie, I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, anyway, so at least there's not that difference. But I never uh, unnoticed the ADR next time I watch it because it, it really, I knew some things were dubbed over. I thought one of the characters was dubbed over um with frank but um definitely you could tell there's two different actors doing who frank is in the intro and then who he is in the the bodysuit well yeah because like there's a line that really sticks out to me as well with like the adr is when kirsty is ribbing her boyfriend about being like she says like you're all this like you're all the same you're all kind of frigid and stuff like that and he's like just like julia and I think she's like talking about the kind of US UK divide of like <sighs> British people being like really prim and proper mm-hmm. and like yeah, yeah you're right and because he says like pardon me or something like pardon that. me which yeah. like is a very is a very kind of like I don't do you know what I mean if you think of like kind of British parlance you'd go like, oh pardon me yeah pardon me pardon. <laughs> if oh. someone does like an impression like that's uh, true that if I was like, doing a bad British impression which they it's only bad. It would be pardon, pardon, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, jolly girl, good, good. Yeah, because uh, I, I think, I, I, I think that's it is. Yeah, it, I know it's done because I think it's delved into in Leviathan. There's like a kind of massive documentary that kind of in two parts that covers this and okay, like, cool, and, Hell, uh, and Hellbound, uh, Hellraiser two. I got to check that doc out. Um. And I didn't realize there was one out about this. So, um, but we're there. And then what kind of triggers it all? Cause we're still pretty early in this movie and it, it will say it's weird. It moves quick. And then we slow down through the, the oh. it, it, it is very much a slow down part. But before that, um, Larry, um, he's, he's helping the movers move a couch up the stairs, which I found very funny. Cause if I had movers, I would be like, no, I'm paying you. I'm not helping you move this couch. Yeah, I, I always, I, always I like, would, I would. Anyway, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I call the movers for this couch. Uh, like, I love, I love that scene. I love that scene. So that's, like, yeah, that scene is um, Julie is up in the attic, fantasizing about her time with Frank, or reminiscing, I should say, with her time with Frank. And it's getting very sexual, and it's a full-on sex scene, and it's intercutting with the couch pushing up the stairs like his dick pumping into her um because it's the senior scene you're seeing the parallels and through that scene frank uh there's a big nail just sticking out of the side of the the, larry yeah larry Larry. closer and closer closer and it just nicks his hand and it is really cringy because it they just rides right through and it's gashing and (laughs) and, uh so he runs up to the attic because he's like well, I, and I think that that scene as well, like if you think about it as well, is like very much like 
putting a very like um subversive image or at least like kind of inviting mainstream audiences into like this kind of subversive world that kind of clive barker is yeah and like because it's kind of the whole film is to do with like sex pleasure pain like the kind of like the boundaries that we'll push ourselves to to kind of seek like this pleasure whether it is through is through pain or whatever and that scene i think perfectly encapsulates mm -hmm. that well that's like i said it's it's the couch and that moving and the blood and and on his hand i mean it's literally the act of sex yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's penetration. It's, it's penetration. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's all, it's all kind of, it's very much like, yeah, pen- so, like imagery. It's gr- but it's gross. <laughs> that, and that's what I kind of love about it. It's like, oh, this of- isn't a sexy movie. Like, everyone's horny, but this isn't a sexy movie. Like, like this isn't like if you're, let's say you're 12, uh, you know, you could rent, you could rent a Friday the 13th film and like get off on it. Like oh yeah, yeah you could you could you could probably pause it yeah, yeah and you could pause that VHS tape and get a couple of pumps off no one it's, it's like yeah you you're not you're not rocking a semi watching no this. no one's being like yeah yeah Julia all right <laughs> this one scene no it, it's it, it makes itself very bleak um so we we have that and he goes upstairs and I mean just copious amounts of blood on his hand I mean they they should go to a hospital his but the blood seeps into the the house the floor of the house where um you know we just kind of under the assumption like frank died there or frank escaped the cenobites from there and he's now reborn we the blood is seeping through the 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 boards of the house or the attic and uh next time we kind of cut back into there uh we see a creature like a human being animated and born out of the woods and it looks great because it looks unhuman at first yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I like I'm trying to think. It almost looks like some of the creatures that you you, you you encounter in Flight of the Navigator. Like, do you know what I mean? That like the little aliens that yeah, like, it's who's in that. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's alien. Like, yeah, that's perfect. It's it's like it's some also in Flight of the Navigator, or it has very like the th- early the thing vibes because there's that goo onto it. Um. And it looks great. So we go there. And then the next thing we cut to is like, I guess enough time has passed because they're immediately ready to host a dinner party. <laughs> uh, what I love about that, that as well is you get like, cause that, that Frank rebirth scene is very much like a, a masterclass. When I think of this movie, effects, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, it, it, we were talking earlier, but especially the budget, it's a masterclass of special effects for sure. When I think of this movie, I think of that scene. I think of two scenes, I should say. I think of that scene, and I think of Frank's death at the end. <laughs> well, it's... it's Because obviously, like, some of it you can tell. It's stuff melting, and, like, the footage is played in reverse. Mm-hmm. And it's like... Like, yeah, watching it on Blu-ray, you can kind of see the details, like, really enhanced. But, like, you feel like... But I, I love I love watching that stuff. Like, practical stuff. And I, I don't mean to, like, sound like an old man waving his fist on a porch like oh, it's better back in my day but like because this is before my day i was born in 1991 like it was 92 but like you know but he's like, not wrong it's it, i don't know it, it it's, makes it scrungy and like horrible it looks like there's something like something you can't just encapsulate with cg it, it like, wor- stuff like i don't know it's got this i don't know if this is sacrilege to say it works here, right? Because like you said, it's grungy and it makes sense and it looks creepy and disgusting. And um, when that scene happens or something like that happens in the new Hulu one, like I'm sure it's going to be good CG, but it's not going to have that same feel that someone handed it compared to um, the time where I – like that ages so well to me, that stuff. The things that don't or like something that does look a little realistic is like um, – and it's great for the time, so I don't want anyone killing me here – is like – the, you know, when you see in the Terminator, uh, him pull the eye, his eye out, like that very much is a fake head that they're uh-huh. ripping into. It's great, but it's different than, um, to use the two as a comparison, it's different practical than here because I don't know, I'm seeing a creature get born. Like you watch The Fly today, and Jeff Goldblum's transformation is yeah. more impressive than, you know, 
uh, recent transformation, or or as you know, most of the CGI likes to be today, just uh, globs of CG um, yeah, matter yeah. flying around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think Screen of like saver. an American werewolf in London, like the yeah. kind of like, transformation sequence in that, like all practical. And like, I think in regards to like that sequence, the sequence here is like, I don't know. It's just unsettling, mm-hmm. like, and I think you can't you can't capture that somewhat with CGI. Do you know what I mean? Like, because it's real. You can sit like almost metaphor. There's a there's a lane. There, there's definitely a lane in appreciation for it, and uh, I I think also uh, I think an issue today with young filmmakers or probably just filmmakers in general want to do that stuff and stu- who you know the financiers say. No, it'll look good CG. Like we still have it. Like I would love to uh, to just be on this tangent. I would love to see that. I guess it's not a remake, but that the original cut of the thing, um, the the remake they had, where it's yes. just, everything was practical, and then they went in and just CGI'd over it, and we don't have that first cut. I'd like to see that because I bet you it, the movie is what it is. I bet you look pretty good. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that prequel. Yeah, that prequel. Cool. Like, I, I saw it at the time and thought, like, this is fine. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you like, I don't know, what it's, a waste. What like that's something like that. It's like you, what a waste. Do you know what I mean all that man hours? Yeah, like, exactly. And you find out it's like, oh, well, it makes sense. They did it CG. It looks, you know, this is not good. And then find out, oh, they did it real. Yeah, it was, do you think it's kind of the same compare? I know you have a uh, a young son. Do you think it's the same comparison of like, you know, kids today watching cartoons and you know, you want them to, you know, they mostly see things that look like today, not like just the 3D, but the clean, the clean animation, everything compared to like when we were kids, you know, it said like those old Nicktoons or like stuff like Rocco or the Rugrats might not connect with them because it's a little grungier looking. Do you think it's the same kind of difference of, you know, people are more trained eye wise to see certain things the time they're in? I think so, but at the same time, like, obviously, yeah, I was born, like, I would have been, yeah, yeah, similar age to you. I would have been, like, prime age, kind of been brought up on, like, CG and its kind of infancy. And Yeah, it, I, always, and, I always think we're in the, the in-between. Yeah, we're kind of like, we are. Like, I, I always think, like, those of us who kind of grew up, like, and kind of came of age on the internet... And like, but still remember a time before, do you know what I mean? Like the internet mm-hmm. was a thing. Like yeah, I remember, no, I do. Do you, do you know what I mean? I remember yeah. dial-up. If you remember dial-up, it's kind of like. <laughs> oh, I remember dial-up, man. That, that, um, I <laughs> go on, talk- I'd ask my mom to use the nickel, go on nick.com, the dial-up, you can, put one call. And, uh, you know, made me like several different AOL, uh, emails that were monitored because they kept getting virus bombed with like porn that I didn't look up. Cause it was five, <laughs> six, but I wanted to go, you know, to the space jam website. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I remember both times and I do think our generation is in a good amount of, or is in that in between. Cause I really do think the CG, like full CG, I don't mean like good CG when it's like Jurassic park, practical CG merge. And it still looks amazing today. Um, I don't think it really hit when they were really relying on heavy to like 2001, 2000 ish. Yeah, like uh, even if you think about like, I always look, think back to like the is it like the Mummy Two or like yeah, yeah. With Scorpion King? Oh yeah, like, that's like, the third. Like, that's oh, that's one of the worst ones. But like when 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 the Scorpion King because he turns up in the Mummy Two, right? I think yeah, so I think it's two or three, but he turns up in it and it's. It's a CG rock, and it's famously just like it looks worse than the PS2 games at the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, like we suffered through that. So I, I don't know, but like in regards to your question about like, like yeah, having a young son, I don't know. He still really appreciates like, like last Christmas I showed him the the the, the like what was it like sixties Grinch. Oh, okay, cool. I always just wondered, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, and I don't, I don't, I, I just think they like. I, I, I might be the wrong person to ask because I'm, I'm still trying to like, do you know what I mean, I'm showing my son like sure. old, old stuff as well. And you'll I'm do, showing... you'll do what I do. Uh, you'll be doing what I'm doing when I 
have a kid too, but no, I just know it. I, it, it just felt yeah. comparable, but um, I kind of get yeah. back on track here a little bit. He um, so but we're at this dinner scene in the movie, and like I said, they just moved in. That weirded me out. That like they're having this big dinner party, and they're just in there, and like a to my knowledge, like two weeks ago, there were like rats and magnets in the kitchen, and they're just like, yeah, everyone, come on over. We have the nice china out. <laughs> um, but um. They're all there, and even uh, his daughter, who we did meet a little earlier, Christy, um, who's now, like, living in town. You could get, like, her mother had passed away, and uh, her and Larry have a really good relationship, her and her father, which I really appreciate it in this movie. And she, um, she there's a boy there. I, I guess he's a son of the other guests, and they're easily drinking and flirting, and, like, everyone's cool with it, which was so odd for a movie it's so out of place for a movie because usually even if she's supposed to be like 20 or whatever that's why i think it's british that's I why know. The, the age of drinking's a a in here babe we got a big drink culture you drink <laughs> yeah he's like four and like when you're 16 it's uh <laughs> um, I, so it's i keep one i keep correcting myself but to pull my cards on the table well larry i keep on calling patrick duffy because i used to think he the guy who starred in the sitcom step by step the suzanne summers <laughs> show they look very similar, so I always used to be like, yeah, Patrick, it's not. It's um, Larry is uh, the barber from Child's Play 3. Oh, okay. Um, so, but, serious horror credentials. Yeah, he's the gives the Chucky the cut. Um, and then gets his uh, throat slit, I think. Um, but he, um, but you're right, though. They're all cool with it. Like, it's, she's drunk, she's that, and um, you know, uh, fuck, uh, what's her name? Um, Julia goes up, upstairs. Like, people are leaving. Julia is like, I'm going upstairs. Uh, Christy is like stumbling away. She's drunk. And Julia's upstairs, basically keeping Frank at bay. She's like, chill and that. She's startled and she kind of talks Christy off a ledge from walking upstairs. And then they go home and they move on with the day. Like, like we kind of move on to the next spot. The next That's spot. That moment you like mentioned there of like Kirsty coming upstairs and seeing like it's tense, Julia, like that kind of like pan you get to Julia and like the way that this Claire Higgins, yeah, the way she's lit in this film and the kind of angles that are on her, she mm. just looks sinister as fuck. And I love she's, it. Is she sinister? Always si- well, she's not at first, but the minute she hooks up the Frank, she always looks sinister. Yeah, and she also looks um the wrong word here but like angelic at the same time like untouchable like there's some aura around her yeah 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 because she's being powered by frank because her motives always seem like she's more possessed than she is into uh-huh. the, the 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 feet um so they do that and then um uh she basically her and frank are uh frank's like look at me like I need blood. That's the whole, he's like, I need blood. Look at what the blood did to me. Yeah. Does the blood measurement of what's needed to rejuvenate make sense? Cause you get a little bit of, a little bit of Larry's blood and you got full on body. But now <laughs> you need like six bot. You need like three humans to, you know, fully get to some skin back. I don't know, but she's like, we need blood. And you know, um, Julia, of course, doesn't even really begrudge her. She's like, all right, I got you. I got your back. Uh, You're back here, Frankie baby. Look, <laughs> I, I think that 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 brings on me on to like a interesting like point of this is that like you talking earlier about the kind of pub, like the kind of general perception of this film. Like seeing the front cover, that you, you could easily mistake that the villain of this piece would be Pinhead and the Cenobites. It, it, it's it's um, <laughs> I've actually I've I mean I've seen. I've seen it on best, like, you know, top slasher, like, like, listicles, where they put help, you know, where they put pin raid, pin head, pin razor, pin head on it. And I'm like, I get, you know, even on the horse, it's like, you guys are well researched, you're putting on it because it's, you know, it's iconography, like, like, like Bob Ross and Freddy Krueger here. But, <laughs> um, nah, it was Jason that fell also, but it's, it's not, he's not, even in at least the first three, like, they show up to clean up the mess of the humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're kind uh, of um, 
and I find it interesting just to to crowbar in uh, Nick Cage here. <laughs> like, uh, obviously, like I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but Panos Cosmotos was working on a Hellraiser reboot at one point, yeah, and, and you can see that he ingested the elements of what he was working on for the Cenobites for Mandy. Oh, they're in Mandy. Those are Cenobites. Yeah, with the Black Skulls. And they kind of perform like a a similar role that they are kind of like called upon by characters to Mm -hmm. do their bidding. And like in this, it's kind of, they are almost agents of, they're agents of chaos. Yeah. they, They also kind of, well, they have their they have their set of rules and they kind of bargain the, with uh, Kirsty to kind of like come to an agreement. That's the funny part. It's like they're methodical, the Cenobites. Uh-huh. So you're right. They're called upon by Kirsty a little later, and you know to to meet like like I'm like oh they should do that like they really out. It's like no drag her away. Like she's gonna bart like. You don't, they, they don't have files on each of these people, you know, before they yeah. call open the box. Um, but, um, before we kind of jump to that though, they, they, the Cenobites, I mean, they were all supposed to talk, which is the funny part too. The, 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 the practice, the facts made them not talk like chatterboxes. I, I mean, he's the fan favorite. He's my favorite. <laughs> um, and they didn't cause of the facts except, the, um, God, I don't know the name of all the Cenobites, to be quite honest with you. But except for uh, uh, Pinhead and um, it just says female Cenobite, but she speaks as well. She, I know she has a name, but I have Wiki right next to me. They have her listed. They don't even have him listed as Pinhead. They just have as lead Cenobite. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think he gets the name Pinhead until la- I don't think she gets a name until later on. That's, yeah, what, they, that's what's interesting about the, this is they are kind of like... Uh, I don't know. Their 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 myth is bigger than their kind of uh, yeah. All in this film, it um it, it, as a franchise, it definitely has the uh, the lineage. It has the unfortunately the same horror lineage that a lot of these mo- movies end up having is where a couple good ones, and then like because they need content, they build out the characters' myths, and they're not well researched. Like um. A comparison I thought, and it's not even with the lineage or any of that, um, is at the end of the movie, Frank is speaking like Freddy Krueger. Yes. He's, li- he's daddy. Yeah, daddy and bit. Like, he calls her bitch a bunch of times. Like, he's like, get over, like, come here. No, like, it. it's Freddy dialogue. I don't think that's on purpose, <laughs> but it's, it, it's the way it's performed. And I think with the, the rip the face part. Um but yeah, the, the Cenobites are interesting. I know there's a whole war on them now, and like Clive Barker's etched that out. But you know, he he didn't he didn't have the, to get a lot of. Unfortunately, to get a lot of these movies made at the time. The creators gave over those rights and wiped their hands with them. Uh, speak for, for, uh, Wes Craven with Freddy Krueger did the one, but he just wanted to get that movie made, wiped hands with it, and then you know he, he dabbled, came back, and um. But so, um, yeah, so now we just kind of get, I'm going to kind of breeze over, but we get like more of a scenes of just Julia bringing, me, uh, bringing men back and killing and hooking up with Frank in between. Yeah. Like, that's kind of like, that's kind of our gist right now. Men comes back. I need another body. Great. But in between then, um, uh, we mentioned this earlier. They're watching boxing on the couch, and uh, Larry and and, uh, and Julia. And he's like, "I thought you hated this stuff." Because I guess she's always probably was like, "Hey, fine." She's like, "I don't give a shit about it." And they hear something fall upstairs, and she, he's like, "I'll investigate," but she knows it's just Frank, and she doesn't want <laughs> the part of her that's like has a bit of a foot out the door is like, "Well, I don't want to kill my husband, even though I'm doing everything else against him." And they go back and they get to the midpoint where she just starts making out with him. And that's why I say he's not the horniest person. He's, he's not in that horny camp of this movie because they would, like if my wife was just making out with me randomly, even though I was going to check on something and they probably haven't touched each other in a while. I'd be like, great, let's, let's, let's continue this and we'll check out that later. Uh, but they don't. And she does convince him to stay back and, 
there's a really creepy scene of just like la of um Larry on top for her saying no. I don't know why he didn't stop anyway because like he should be like why are you so disinterested? Um and uh Frank coming out the 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 the, the, the shadows and cuts a rat over him and spills yeah. blood over them. And then we cut to the next day basically. <laughs> yeah, I got like this film has some really like just like surrealist imagery that's why i think it's kind of subversive do you know what i mean it's kind of like there's stuff in this that's just like this is weird like oh it's it's like, totally weird i um i failed to mention i think mike the creepiest part of the nlsu what you think the creepiest part as well like um the the homeless man who eats crickets off of out of his beard in the yeah. or bugs in the pet shop that uh, that kirsty works at uh, creepy is part of the whole movie because it's disgusting and it's it's like what the fuck and that's all it's just a what the fuck scene it's nothing else. We well, just have that guy kind of popping up. There's like you first see him like in like a like peering out of a doorway and mm. he just like turns up throughout the film and I I love the kind of the Kirsty B plot in this and it's like this film's got so much going on because she has this kind of like mystery like do you know what I mean she's trying to like solve a mystery I'd say like grieving her mother a bit some symbolics there for that but uh she's I mean, trying to figure out what's going on right because she's mm -hmm. like snooping about the house that well, she has her plot where she goes to the hospital and stuff well like that's that. where um so after that the dad is where I was like oh I do like their father daughter relationship because he's just confiding in his daughter like there's something up with my wife. She won't leave the house. Can you just go hang out with her? Like, and she's like, all right. And as she's doing that, she sees her luring a man in the house, goes in the house, finds Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank is like, come to daddy, tries to get in session with her. She takes, she takes the puzzle box and she realizes, okay, he doesn't like this. Chucks it out the window, runs out the house, picks up the puzzle box um it's covered in blood and she wakes up in the hospital or not wakes up but like then she is in the like hospital too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. and that's right this b plot of her in the hospital dealing with the distraught and then she finds uh she does oh she still has the puzzle box and and opens it because that we do kind of leave the other characters aside for now like we really don't see larry until we don't even see his demise really yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, but I think that's good because obviously, like, it puts us in like it cleverly puts us in the place of Kirsty, right? We're kind mm -hmm. of like, just we as switch kids. gears completely, and, and like, like we get that, like, there's that, like, some of the imagery in the hospital bit, like, just before she wakes up as well. There's just like the whole screen is enveloped with like a flower opening, mm -hmm. and then like there's that nurse sat there watching the TV, which just looks like it's a black screen with <laughs> blooming, which is yeah. weird. And then yeah. she goes down that corridor, gets chased by that like demon, which like watching it in this blue like slug monster, watching it on Blu-ray, you can very much like see the gurney and the person pushing it. On yeah, the but you can, I was you so can, into you can, it. You can forgive it. Like, you yeah, it's like, kind of swept up in it. Like, like, you're like, ah, I'd rather that than they like digitally try and remove it or something. No, it, it, it works because they, they open that up, right? And it's like, first, like, oh, this is a dream sequence kind of. It's not. She opens up the thing and walks through this long, swooping hallway, then to just run back out with that thing. and Which I guess those corridors come more to play in like two, right? Two, that, yeah. Like, their domain is this kind of. Uh, just kind of like I don't know, world of these was, kind of I, like corridors. Yeah, I always said it was like a lab, like the second like one a lab place in a yeah, labyrinth. Yeah, yeah. Um, at least her storyline, like she's back in the psych, is more of a psych ward now, not just a hospital. Uh -huh. And but this is when the the Cenobites join. They they come to yeah. her and they're like, "You called us." She's like, "No, no." And then she says, "Frank." She's like, I, I, you, he escaped. And they're like, he, you dumb girl. He didn't escape. Everyone says this. <laughs> and uh, she's like, no, 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 I'll get him for you. Um, so they, to their word, they say, okay. Um, but they do have one line I fucking love. Cause you kept, you, he, he mentioned about the tent, um, about pleasure, you know, and this, and 
uh, Pinhead goes, no, save those tears for your, for the for the pleasure. Oh no no you, no 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 no! Is it like save those tears like uh like with there's a there's enough suffering coming or something like that? Oh okay. yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah yeah yeah. But I thought yeah, but it was for of like you'll want them because it's gonna feel good later. <laughs> um, there, there's like um, he's got some amazing lines like Doug Bradley like is oh, it like, uh, like he's like for some we are angels for some we are demons and stuff like that and it's like ah oh. like and when he pops up and he's like we've got so much sights to show you and it's like yes and he, he's like um oh he's like oh she's like go to hell and he's like oh well we got to bring you back <laughs> you know oh it's so good and they like you said they, they even though he's on the cover and like this is misperceived by i think the general concise of like a uh, culture they, the movie itself is peppered in so perfectly with him because it's not his tale or they're not there to scare you, the audience. They're there to scare the characters. Um, so she does go back to the house now, right? And, uh, I mean, she, maybe it's been a couple days. She has not seen her dad. Uh-huh. And she goes back to the house and Christy's like, I'm sorry, Julia answered the door and I mean, she's just over, and if I've failed to mention, Julie, we get so many shots of Julia just now, like, smirking in the revel of, like, she enjoys killing, she enjoys being with Frank, like, she's on board. Yes. Um, And, but they run back, and she goes up, and she sees her dad waiting at the, at the vanity, and he's like, oh, it's all right, we took care of it, you know, and he seems off, and then the more you see it, the more you look at it, like, he, the, you know, he's 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 overtaken Frank's physical form or cut his skin off. Yeah, yeah, he's got Larry's him. skin on now. Right? Yeah, Larry, sorry, Larry's skin on him. And it's peeled up like really bad lines. I mean, a face off taught us anything. It's that face <laughs> is perfectly aligned. And yeah, 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 yeah. And it's yeah, yeah, bot, bot, uh, like skin can perfectly fit over bodies, even though they're of like uh, different proportions and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> skin is like sheets. But like um, but what a, like a great performance by um, by the uh, by by the actor who play, yeah Andrew Robinson who plays Larry because obviously mm-hmm. like he's doing like a kind of like like uh, Nick Cage or yeah, he's, he's doing him. two roles he's embodying like Frank and again like an ingenious thing from the the effects department of like oh we we're, we're just kind of give the audience a little like wink wink mm-hmm. that, that, that something's going on with that kind of like goop around not that. just his performance the goop around him yeah yeah and, yeah. And, uh, it, it does make you think like does kirsty not see i was wondering like, i think she's goop. so stressed but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it looks so off and then you know kirsty kind of steps back because frank just starts going you know give he starts talking like frank like trying to dad come to daddy Oh. And, um, you know, like Kirsty, oh, not Kirsty, Julie is just watching in like pleasure that this is happening now. She's like, yeah. Um, but you know, she puts up a fight and she's like, I want to see the body she's body. They go back to the attic and there's that charred corpse of her dad, just pick clean, but blood on bones. And, um, she can't tell. And then she realizes, and she's able to, uh, you know, she has her and um, they have her cornered and Frank stabs Julie, Julia um, with his switchblade and he doesn't give a shit. He's like, whatever, because he wants, because he's a deviant. He's a fucking creep. He wants, he wants uh, Kirstie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter how. He's like, I'm cool with incest and like rape. Like, I want Kirstie. And um, stabs Julia because he's like, fuck this. And that's when, um, you know, she scratches his face and it starts peeling off. And they kind of they kind of go about it. And then she sets up a trap for him in the attic, basically. Or at least that's what he says. And the Cenobites come. And they work their bidding. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Like, uh, what's the line? Um... Jesus, I just wept. Love, Jesus wept. Yeah, I love it. 
I love it. Just like I don't lo- crashed our face. I love that it cuts away at the perfect moment as well. You kind of like get the burst and then it's gone and it's that door. It's like kind of editing. It's like it's, it's one editing. of the best. It's one of the best kills and effects in like cinema because you the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh of the hook for listeners of the hooks piercing the the skin and ripping and he they're like you don't want to see this to the girl because yeah. now they do have a bit of um. I mean, they do play with her a little bit where they're like, we're going to get you, but they also let her go. Yeah, but then obviously they do come after her, right? They yeah. Do, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what um, I love about this kind of end sequence, like once Frank's off, is the film almost transitions again. It's like, it turns into like a fun house horror movie, right? Yeah. With like, just like the the different villains popping up and kind of get off in it, different ways. Yeah, yeah. It's this, because uh, a lot of the horror movies have a common thing. It's th- that version in the Funhouse. It's this movie's version of a, a like a, a body maze, like a slasher. There's always like you know someone running around, and every body you've seen that's dead falls out. Yes, that's yeah, this yeah, version yeah. of that movie, of that trope. And they um they do run outside. The boyfriend's there. I'm sorry, he does nothing. He was worthless in this movie. We don't even have him. <laughs> but they're outside and. Uh, they kind of watch this house blow up, and um, we then we see like the slug, like the basically Satan incarnate this like uh, horse-headed, like skeletal thing in the fire. She puts the um, yeah, but she it's puts the, the it's, puzzle box in the it's fire. The homeless man, right? The homeless yeah. man comes over, and like so, again, a, a thing I love in movies. Uh, it's it's probably why I like the Maniac Cop film so much. Is is a fire walk. Uh, and like, yeah, he kind of just gets set on fire and then turns into again. What a, what a practical effect that is! As it looks well, great. It just looks he, great. He's um, yeah, he's he's he, you know, it's it's Satan incarnate. I think he, the, I think, I always felt like Satan or another like demon. Yeah, it's just was, like wa- was watching the events go on of this, and like, you know, they kind of knew he kind of knew Kirsty would do something or someone in his life, so he's just keeping tabs, and this is the final tab. Yeah, I almost think like my my kind of reading is of it is that the the gentleman who has the pleasure box can shape shift, right? So obviously that demon can shape shift. So it's the homeless man keeping tabs on where the the salesman in Morocco is the salesman in Morocco. It's the same guy. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and that goes back to your point about um, it being a fairy tale, because it's like Aladdin. Uh-huh, yeah. You know, um, with the... Make with the, sure the lamp, yeah, yeah. With the lamp and the, the merchant and it being the gene, you know, it it's same kind of uh, dramatics. Um, yeah, and then do we just get a... After that, though, uh, I know I mentioned earlier, we kind of get a zoom out through the looking of the pleasure box seeing their story um come to an end i mean it doesn't there's a three this is kind of a three-part tale um and just saying what's your pleasure sir you know informing me we're selling it to the next this box is now being sold to the next person yeah Yeah, yeah. um and uh so yeah i mean that that's hellraiser as best as i and petros or can explain it but is there anything i missed or that you want to cover have you on no, um, just that I think like Ashley Lawrence's performance as Kirsty is like fantastic. I think she she's amazing. She's like somebody I'm like, why didn't we see her in more? Like she, I think I've seen her in this, the second part, and then it's like, is that it? I, yeah, I don't. Well, I, I think she's been in stuff, but like, yeah, I shouldn't I think say she's that not like it. a prop. Do you know what I mean? She never got like a prominent role. Obviously, Claire Higgins as Julia again. She's I'm, phenomenal. Julia should be a. She should. She, I'm holding. I don't know why I'm holding. Across. She should be there with my my toys, right? She should really. She should be there with for your Freddies and your Jasons, over. Um, well, the the original plan for the second one, and I she's the villain in the second one. She's Frank in the second one. Yeah, but the set like she was basically supposed to like moving forward after that was being set up as being like the new pinhead. It's like, so it's so which fun. Would have been great. That would have been amazing. She would have loved that shit. But the the actress herself like is like a kind of rev- she was a revered like uh, stage actress. 
So like kind of didn't want to get, didn't want to go down the, the Robert England role of just being like, do you know what I mean? The rest of my but, life is. <laughs> but you already did that. I don't know. I don't know. That would have been great. Cause it's kind of the same. Um, like can't like the, the, not the new can't and more Clyde Barker, like, Candyman, that first movie, like the first movie is an immaculate film. I love that fucking movie. Uh-huh. Two and three, I think, are kind of they're fun, but they're sloppy. They just more leaned into being a slasher. And there's a little background, but like, actually, two's still has the bones of it, and we learn like more background in this. Uh-huh. Three is just a full on like we need TNA in a movie, in a horror movie, and that that's that <laughs> movie. But same kind of thing there, like Virginia Matson. Was set you know, up, was set up to then be a candy man. Um, uh, cause, and I'm noticing just the similarities, even with the pyre, right? Even with the the fire and the uh, yep. at the end of it and the cold, like those are two things that are very relevant to Clyde Barker. Because I know, I mean, Candyman, his um, you know, it's out of place, right? Candyman takes place in Chicago, and it's like, why the hell are they having a bonfire in the middle of Chicago in the yes. winter when it's like 10 degrees? But in London, where the story is based from, or the Liverpool, town, Liverpool, yeah, Liverpool they yeah. do something like that in the winter time. And they said, you know, as a filmmaker, he said, "Well, we'll just make it work that way." That's in can. I'm sorry, that's I'm only bringing it up here because that's in Hellraiser too. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same parallels, like he, but it's it's not as obvious. It's like, oh, you're just using the same tropes again. And I think it's that thing of like, I don't know. I think he's a very, he's a, like he's always been like a very progressive writer and like, obviously this felt like to, I don't know. It feels almost daring at the time to s- focus and center like this female villain. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you think of like a lot of like slashers, do you know what I mean? We kind of, and it's not, the thing is this, it's, I think this film is undefinable in, in a way, like, cause it's yeah. kind of, you can't really put your, you can't really go, Oh yeah. It's in the same lineage of, um, do you know what I mean? Like, how, do you know what I mean? You see she, the lineage from like uh, Halloween. To... No, it's not. Or, or if you're going with like female centric, uh, like villains, it's like very far from it. Not at all. But it's like not fatal attraction. You know, she's not a scorn lover. Who's... But you think, yeah, yeah. But you think about like horror, and you think about like uh, the kind of like this doesn't have this doesn't start with. Halloween, and like just like so many, do you know what I mean? Like uh, Friday the Thirteenth, it's like they saw Halloween and went, "Oh, let's try and." Catch oh no, this is Halloween. this is more of, uh, and I mean this very positively. This is more of a episode of Tales from the Crypt, or Ooh. something from an anthology film, than it is a replicable uh, heart, like just like horror trope, because like it's just like here's this weird tale, like you said earlier, it could be a one-off about the fucked up situation. Um, in in our sex fantasy land. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I like, and I got a level with you. Like, I I started watching this at like, I'm trying to think what time it was. Like, maybe yeah, you saw you tweet. Uh, you're starting it, and I think it was like uh, three o'clock my time. So I try, uh, let me try and do the math. It's probably like nine o'clock here. Yeah. Or like yeah, eight o'clock here. Um, and it started getting dark. And then, like, where I'm recording, like, for people listening, is like this kind of little outhouse. And mm-hmm. then I realised, like, when the fo- when the when the movie had ended, I was like, it's just dark outside. That's crazy. I was fucking like, I was terrified. Like, and that's the <laughs> thing: as a 31 year old man, this film still has the impact to just like get under my skin and make and like it. It, it all boils down to to some of the small elements, just the mm-hmm. kind. Of, the, the tone that the film sets, the kind of performances, the score. I think the score is fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the score. The score is, um, as most movies, it enhances it. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take away from any of it. The film itself, though, it is a really nice piece of music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Christopher Young like music, and it's just like, and it has like a, a kind of childlike element to it at times, and. It just has this, I don't know, creepy quality. Like the music it's, kind of embodies a cold hand, like kind of creeping hmm. up your neck. That, and it's, oh. Yeah, it's good icon- iconography for that. Cold hand. That's a perfect way. I, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the, 
the, the imagery you brought up and uh, <laughs> the way we've discussed it, because that's right exactly what this is. This is a cold hand. It is, it's not supposed to be comfort, right? Like I, I have, I have my horror comfort. I'm a, I have a horror podcast, but I have, I can't watch it all the time myself. Like I have my horror comfort movies though, right? Uh-huh. They don't feel like cold hands. They're your Freddy Krueger's. Um, but this is a cold, this is uncomfortable. I need to be in the mood to watch a Hellraiser film, not a uh, casual, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not casual date night. I, and I, I, I think the film is supposed to make you feel these ways and that's why it's so effective and i think it's supposed, it's, it's supposed to challenge you and i think like what it is as a kind of piece of subversive art is the fact that it kind of sneaks it into kind of i don't know it's kind of got popcorn and bubblegum wrapping that it makes it palatable for yeah. like wider audience but then like it's like a gateway drug to like weird of films do you know yeah I mean? that's a good way to put it gateway drug to weird because it, it presents itself um it presents itself more polished right or more yeah. of what you've seen especially with having a horror icon on the cover or I, horror iconography like that on the cover um it does what uh the way you just put it, it does how i like to describe um back when game of thrones was popular i always say game of thrones did this thing where it 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 brought the audience slowly into the fantasy of into the sci-fi fantasy of that series. It started off like everyone's gonna love it because it's just you know knights and it's not. I know yeah, what it yeah, is, yeah, but it's, it's this. There's no yeah yeah yeah. Like, there's no magic. There's nothing. And then like slowly you get magic. And then someone like my mother was like, I love that show. And the 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 uh you know the dragons and this. And if I did introduce that show to her. As that, she would have never watched it. And that is what Hellraiser does. It says, hey, come on in. You're just going to see a nice, maybe little splatter film. Um, some cool effects creep. And then, you like said, you get a little weirder. And then if you're into that, there is a whole lane of films and stories to check out yeah, that are yeah, yeah. even darker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Like, I've, I've, yeah. I just, I just think that kind of, I don't know. It's Clive Barker, I think. I think it's, I don't know. He's almost like an undersung hero in a way. In the, in, I know, I know he's like well known in certain circles, but like, I don't know. I've, I, I wish he got like the kind of praise that like uh, a Stephen King did does. That would be cool. Kind of being like these, just this great kind of, and he's prolific in his own right. Do you know what I mean not not to the degree of Stephen King, but you like, could degrade Stephen King on this pod. It's fine. <laughs> no, but like Stephen King is like ridiculously prolific in mm-hmm. his output do you know what i mean he's kind of like i don't know like yeah it, it's you, you look um, at the amount of books he's written it's just like insane but like, it's insane uh especially how thick some of them are too and then it's like you did four a year <laughs> um but you know clyde barker definitely um i mean it's the good thing is though he does have his success in his audience and like you know um and I believe he is going to be involved more with this uh, new Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or, uh, I, know, I, think I know with the like the movie series, he very quickly kind of took it, his name off of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, he did what Wes Craven did. Yeah, it was no longer it was no longer Clive Barker's Hellraiser. It was just Hellraiser. Hell, Hell, Hellraiser three, baby. Hellraiser in space. <laughs> yeah and like uh th- I that think happened th- this is a franchise that suffers from that um old thing of i think there's a scott derrickson entry is uh, there? yeah 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 that, the fuck? that was written as something else and then is kind of shoehorned to be a hellraiser i gotta movie. find that because he um because yeah, it it that's what they were doing. They were, the the whoever owned it was just shoehorning and what they can to keep the rights. Hey, pop and pinhead, call it Hellraiser. Yeah. Tool your script around. Um, and it's silly to think to me too. Um, I guess of its history is at one point like this doesn't fit in. We were just talking about slashers and horror icons and this and that. It doesn't fit in with them. It, uh, the look wise, iconography wise, they fit in. But Freddy vs Jason was going to end with pinhead pulling them down into hell uh-huh um and after watching this and talking more about it and the thematics and the and things 
that doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, like, yeah, none of it makes sense. They're horror, you know, fantasies. But this doesn't make sense. Like, <laughs> like um, I think it actually happened in the com in a comic book. They still got away with it too, but yeah. So, so the 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 Hellraiser film, uh, the Scott Derrickson one, is Inferno. Hellraiser Inferno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's the one. And yeah, it was written as something else uh, in the same way that Eight uh, Millimeter Two was written as another film. Wait, there's an Eight Millimeter Two. Yep, it was just uh, the studio just changed the name of it to Eight Millimeter Two. And that's has, a whole. It has a no 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 relevance to Jesus Christ. That's that's a whole different rant. Because I was say Eight Millimeter is the sneakiest. They tried to advertise that movie as like a Nick Cage action like thriller, and it is just not that at all. And that's a whole nice. different. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Talking about talking about dirty movies, like talking about movies that are just dirty. Eight millimeter is that. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and and I will still I will still say this. I've been saying it for years. Release the Schumacher cut. Oh, there's a different cut. He made a different cut. It's dirtier. Oh, I gotta see it. Let's release it. <laughs> Let's try and find that cut, baby. Yeah. Some yeah. good James Gandolfini, early James Gandolfini in that movie, too. Lovely. Lovely. Uh, but anyway, uh, Petros, um, no, nah, this was excellent. As always, I've always, uh, always enjoyed uh, our conversations. Um, where can uh, where can the people find you doing your many of work? <laughs> and anything will be below with uh, your links as well. So you can find me on all the good podcast platforms. All you have to type in is Caged In Copla Connections. And yeah, there's a kind of plethora of stuff. There's every single Nicolas Cage film has been covered on that podcast. We're deep into looking at the Coppola extended family. Uh, I revisit Cage films from now and then, whether it is kind of anniversaries or kind of just because I fancy it. Every January is Cageuary. <laughs> At Caged In, we look at four different Nick Cage films then. And, yeah, you can find me on all the socials as well. So that is Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Letterbox, and TikTok, all at Caged In Pod. And, I'm all, yeah, I'm always just sharing dumb stuff. Yeah, it's fun. They're fun accounts. I think recently uh, we started following your TikTok account even, and it's it's enjoyable. Yeah, uh, outside your Instagram and Twitter for years, and the TikTok one just popped up. But really, just really fun stuff, uh, especially if you're a Nick Cage fan and a Coppola fan. I still need to get that new Nick Cage book myself and read it. Oh, Age of Cage, yes, yes. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Keith Phipps will, yeah. That other thing, I, I get to speak to some amazing people. So Keith Phipps, who wrote Age of Cage, will be appearing on the podcast at some point. Um, uh, yeah, possibly in the past when this episode. Yeah, this is going to yeah. be the end of summer at this point, probably. But so, that's... yeah, anyone who kind of has written a book on the Coppola family, Nicolas Cage, I'm chatting to him. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'll speak to anyone. I've had some amazing guests. Of, uh, I put out an amazing series called the Caged In Pig Cast, where I've talked to some of the key players. That was excellent. That was from beautiful. from the movie Pig, and like kind of, um, I, I capped it off by speaking to the one and the only Brandy the Pig earlier this year as well. Uh, dive back into my back catalogue to find that episode and listen to what the hell I'm talking about. Excellent. Well, <laughs> you guys know where to find me uh, here at uh, Flyover State of Fear and Flyover State of Film, YouTube, and wherever your podcasts. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Flyover State Fear and Chandanga One. All right, stay frightful, everyone. Welcome to Flyover State of Fear.